Well, thank you all for uh, coming today. Uh, we have uh, this last panel, the uh, Enforcers panel, which it is my pleasure to be the moderator of. My name is Mark Toby. I am the relatively new uh, Agriculture Council at the Department of Justice Antitrust Division. Uh, actually, there are two pieces to my uh, job. One is state relations and one is agriculture. So with this panel of uh, state attorneys general and uh, my federal counterparts who do agriculture work, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that for me. And uh, so we're very pleased today to be able to talk about the enforcement landscape uh, in agriculture and antitrust and uh, add into that uh, commodities regulation. And we have today with us uh, three uh, attorneys general that I'm very pleased uh, to uh, have gotten to know a little bit. Uh, two of these uh, fine gentlemen are part of the antitrust uh, committee that interfaces with the uh, U.S. Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, and then uh, General Bullock from Montana is, has been very involved in the agriculture aspects of uh, the Attorney General, Attorney's General's work. So we have the Attorney General of Montana, Steve Bullock, and we will go through one by one. This, this panel is a little bit different from the ones that you just heard. This will be more of a a statement talking about uh, work in the uh, agriculture and, and uh, enforcement area. Uh, we'll go one by one through the panel. Uh, then uh, after everyone's made a state, their statements, uh, we'll have a little bit of a discussion. And then we will take questions in the same manner in which we've done it before, which is that please write your questions and we'll have the uh, FFA volunteers come and get your questions. and. Toward the end of the panel, uh, we'll see, uh, I'll look through them and see if there's anything that we can, uh, can address with this panel. I'm going to say uh, uh, off the bat, because maybe uh, these folks uh, wouldn't, uh, would not want to say it, uh, we're all enforcers. We all have investigations or cases that we can't talk about. And that's one reason why we have to do the presentation the way that we're doing it. And I apologize in advance. Uh, maybe some of the questions will actually go to matters that we can't talk about. It, it isn't that we, uh, we're trying to hide the ball, it's just that that is the way that these investigations have to be conducted. So let me start by introducing, uh, with great pleasure, Steve Bullock, the Attorney General of Montana. Steve uh, was elected as Montana's 20th Attorney General in November of 2008. Uh, his career in public service began as chief counsel to the Montana Secretary of State. He went on to serve for four years with the Montana Department of Justice, uh, first as an ex executive assistant attorney general and then as the acting chief deputy in Montana. He also served as the attorney general's legislative director. From 2001 through 2004, he practiced law in Washington, D.C. at Steptoe and Johnson and he served as an adjunct professor at my alma mater, George Washington University School of Law. Prior to his election in uh, Montana, he worked in private practice in Helena, and uh, uh, he, he was born in, in Montana and graduated from uh, high school and the public schools in Montana and got his degree from Claremont McKenna and his law degree from Columbia Law School. So, Steve? Thanks, Mark. And uh, on my behalf of myself and the other panelists, I'd like to thank the Department of Justice and USDA and their dedicated staff for pulling this together today. I think we've all learned a lot, and it wouldn't have been possible without hard work from folks like you, Mark. In 1999, I was an Assistant Attorney General at the Montana Department of Justice, and I had the opportunity to provide testimony to the Senate Commerce Committee. At that time, uh, the committee was grappling with the issues of how mergers in the agriculture industry had, had affected consumers. Following year in Colorado, the USDA convened a summit to discuss livestock and grain issues. State and federal gov governmental regulators came together to discuss the vexing issues surrounding market concentration 
and its impact on consumers and producers. In many respects, it's uh, deja vu all over again. Everything I testified about a decade ago, highly concentrated markets, potential abuse of market power to harm both producers and consumers, the need for greater market transparency, and a plea for greater coordination efforts in regulation enforcement, it's as true today, if not more so. So on the one hand, I think that there's reason for skepticism and indeed pessimism. Yet fast forwarding a decade plus later, uh, there are bright spots on the horizon. Within two months of my coming into office last year, JBS National called off its proposed merger. The merger threatened to combine the world's largest beef packer with the nation's fourth largest, concentrating over 80% of the nation's cattle capacity in just three farms, three firms, and threatening to both reduce demand for ranchers and output for consumers. And when you think about it, it's unlikely that their decision to walk away from that proposed transaction was attributable just to a change of heart. It was the result of the United States Department of Justice and 16 states joining hand in hand to stop it, having filed suit to block that merger four months prior. Another bright spot is the fact that uh, this workshop is even being held today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's certainly not the first time that regulators have gathered together to learn about and discuss these concerns, but I think, I imagine it is the first time that the United States Attorney General and the United States uh, Secretary of Agriculture and this many AGs and others have come together. And it's as, that's as it should be, because it's not just about a rural way of life or clinging to some nostalgic past. It's just practical. It's about ensuring the competitiveness of agricultural markets for all of our sakes. America's rural and urban economies absolutely depend on each other. The rural economy has often been the barometer of the nation's economy as a whole. And when rural America is suffering, we can expect the nation's economy to suffer as well. Agriculture at ranks is one of the top sectors of most of our state economies. And while the agriculture heritage of all of our states differs, sometimes dramatically, the concerns about market concentrations, transparency, and effective regulation, they cross geographical boundaries and their shared concerns irrespective of the crops we produce and the animals that we raise. For example, uh, well, Montana, we don't have the significant corn, soybean, or hog production that you find in the Midwest and in, here in Iowa, but agriculture is still my state's largest industry. In Montana, our do dominant ag commodities are beef cattle and wheat and barley, with the value of crop and livestock production about $3 billion in 2008. And the economic health of our one million Montanans is inextricably intertwined with the economic health of our agriculture economy. The changes in those industries that influence our farmers and ranchers over the past decade, it really has changed the face of agriculture itself. For example, in 1984, the Montana landscape was dotted with almost 200 grain elevators. Today, there's less than 50, even as production has risen. Nationwide, as we heard, the top four beef packers process about 85% of our beef, and the top four pork pa packers around 65% of the pork, and just a handful of multinationals now dominate the seed and trade industry. Overlaying all this, we have a rail transportation system that our grandparents could not have comprehended at this point. In 1930, there were over 130 Class I railroads. Today, there are seven. Four of those seven control over 95% of ton miles hauled in the United States. Yesterday, uh, the states, 14 so far, had signed on, and we submitted comments that from the state's perspective, the state AGs intend to serve as a starting point to help frame this discussion as we go forward. Uh, yet we also know that there's a lot more to be done. Given there's going to be a number of workshops, those comments covered more than just seeds or seeds and hogs. And I think that they squarely address many of the eight issues that we're grappling with today. For seeds, the, issue that this, the issues that the seed industry face are incredibly complex. They do require a thorough understanding of not just antitrust jurisprudence or law, but also of intellectual property laws and the way that these two areas of law intersect. And the DOJ and USDA should explore the concerns that have been raised and consider whether there's basis for changes in policy and existing law. And for dairy, the Capra-Volstead Act and the current milk pricing scheme under the Agriculture Marketing Agreement Act 
need be reviewed to ensure that they can continue to protect and benefit dairy farmers as originally intended. And for the meat industry, the USDA and DOJ should explore legislative or reg regulatory revisions that will ensure compliance with the Packers and Stockyards Act, specifically whether it would be available or would be valuable to adopt rules that regulate captive supply procurement methods. Further, we should explore to what extent state involvement would potentially benefit enforcement of the PSA. And on an earlier panel, uh, Iowa Attorney General Tom Miller had made that offer to Christine Varney and the Secretary. And that's an offer that we take seriously because uh, we found that when the states and the federal government are working together, we can typically get much more done. When it comes to rail, our comments that we submitted spell out our support of legislation that will reform the framework and functions of the Surface Transportation Board and legislation that would repeal the outdated antitrust exemptions that railroads have reaped the benefits of for so long. The legislation would simply bring railroads under the same rules as almost every other business must follow. Frankly, we can't, we, we're not going to be able to turn back the hands of time. Enforcers can't open up state-sponsored packing plants. I can't go back to Montana and start my own Class I railroad. Rather, I think that our role is ultimately to ensure that any additional consolidation or integration in the agriculture sector does not occur without a critical and coordinated review. Our role is that there is a regulatory framework that fills some of the gaping holes that exist and that, and that where there are potential market failures, actual or perceived, we vigorously investigate and when appropriate enforce our laws. And most critically as enforcers, our role is to work together. I, for one, think that these workshops are a productive first step in understanding the issues that face many of our producers every day. I've heard from farmers and ranchers in my home state <laughs> that they feel like that this has been a long time coming. But I hope that we can all agree that these workshops, even if they have been a long time coming, present both the opportunity and a promise to a renewed commitment. Thanks so much. Thank you, Attorney General Bullock. Now uh, we will hear from Attorney General Chris Coster of Missouri. Uh, Chris Coster was sworn in as the 41st Attorney General of the State of Missouri in 2009. From 2004 to 2008, Mr. Coster represented the 31st District of, uh, in the Missouri Senate uh, and contributed to debate over a number of interesting topics like stem cell research, tort, tort reform, and the elimination of Medicaid fraud. Prior to his election to the Missouri Senate, Mr. Custer served as a uh, county prosecutor and prosecuting attorney in a small rural county called Cass County in Missouri. He also practiced law in a Kansas City law firm, Blackwell and Sanders, and served as an assistant attorney general uh, in Missouri from 1991 to 1993. He was born in St. Louis. He received his degree from the University of Missouri and his law degree from the University of Missouri School of Law. Uh, in addition, he has an MBA from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, Attorney General Chris Costa. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's been an extraordinary day and uh, in a lot of ways. One, it's the first antitrust conference I've ever attended where there are 800 people in the audience <laughs> <laughs> who aren't scrambling to file their CLE hours with the local bar. <laughs> uh, AGs, particularly AGs in the Midwest, of course, are, have historically uh, been involved in agricultural issues, um, although outside of the antitrust area typically. Uh, in Missouri, as in Iowa, I think uh, CAFO production uh, is a probably three of the top five cases in my office uh, in Missouri re uh, revolve around CAFO production. Uh, and the controversies that uh, accompany those all over the country. So agriculture is always in the top of every Midwestern AG's minds. Uh, but we're also involved in uh, the takeover of, of uh, grain facilities that have been uh, subject to Ponzi schemes uh, in recent years, uh, licensing of agricultural production, uh, typical environmental cases, groundwater runoff uh, and the like. And then moving into the antitrust area, uh, Missouri, as many of the states here represented, were involved in the Zeneca case recently, as well as the American cyanamide case. 
I've only been on the job at Missouri for about a, coming up on a year and a half, but right as soon as we walked in the door, the antitrust issues that are symbolized by today's conference were really front and center and remain a, a topic of almost constant discussion between attorneys general around the country. I come here in kind of an odd dual role as, uh, as the attorney general from Missouri. Um, I come from the state that uh, houses uh, and is home to many important companies in this area, including one that is uh, a topic of constant discussion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> along with Rich Cordray, uh, the Attorney General to my left, you're right. Uh, I also am co-chair of the National Association of Attorneys General Antitrust Working Group. And so no matter which hat I happen to be wearing, um, Missouri wants to be at the table, uh, whether that table is uh, set here in the mid Midwest or is set at the Justice Department or anywhere else in the country, Missouri wants to be at the table as these things um, are decided and I think has a special interest uh, in that regard. What do attorneys general think about when they think about these ag issues that we have discussed today? Well, we have our historic and traditional role, uh, which is to use the antitrust laws and, importantly, the consumer protection laws to protect against abusive contractual language and to guard against any competitive behavior that unnaturally uh, extends patents. In the antitrust working group that General Cordray and I work on, we also act as a supporting organization to, to one degree or another, however you want to phrase it, to the Department of Justice uh, in their analysis of market definition uh, and in their fact-finding efforts. We, are, it, we serve uh, as a local eyes and ears to the Department of Justice as they think through, as uh, Christine Varney's organization thinks through the difficult questions that have been raised here today. And then at the end of that uh, analysis, we either have the ability to act in concert with the Department of Justice or to go in our own uh, direction. Speaking for myself, there's a, a third principle that I, I try to advance in, as we all discuss these issues. And that is the principle of some, bringing some finality to these issues. Um, again, speaking only for myself, I don't think that these discussions should go on endlessly. People on either side of these complicated and um, complex issues deserve answers to their questions. And so while the antitrust working group and all of us individually and as antitrust enforcers have an ongoing uh, responsibility to monitor the anti-competitive behavior that is occurring in the agricultural sector to the extent that it is, that, and that is an ongoing uh, effort, bringing finality to discrete and individual decisions so that companies and interested parties are simply not left for years wondering what is going on, I think is a principle that to a large degree we agree, we agree among ourselves on. And, uh, and try to advance. These are complex issues, that having been said, and there's no date certain we can offer as we think through difficult problems, but we don't want to think through them forever. Um, one other aspect that strikes me as interesting is the role that private <laughs> litigation plays in these questions. Uh, to draw an analogy to the uh, computer arena, you have the litigation going on in, in Delaware right now between Intel and AMD, and an, a private party-on-party -party litigation, piece of litigation uh, that is occurring in that state. And so I think in general terms, uh, attorneys general look at those questions, look at the, that litigation and wonder, are the antitrust issues in the private litigation framed correctly? And additionally, to what extent would regulatory uh, involvement with the public sector getting in, involved in those cases, either as an intervening party uh, or as someone who is bringing separate litigation, as occurred in that case in Delaware, where the state of New York actually left New York to file their case in the court in Delaware, um, does, uh, does public, is the public interest advanced by a separate piece of litigation? 
Those are all things that we think about because when two major parties are privately litigating, their interests are represented, but who is in the process to represent the public's interest? One question that could arise, theoretically, as we go down the line in the private litigation that is occurring in St. Louis, in Judge Weber's court, um, in, the, uh, in the seed issue between Monsanto and, and Pioneer, uh, is when that litigation proceeds to a point where the antitrust questions that are at issue there are decided in one way or, an or another, if the antitrust issues are decided so that the questions remain and are allowed to go to trial and become live questions, then I would think that a lot of parties, both at the state level and perhaps at the federal level, are going to look at that and ask the question, are the public interests being adequately represented as that table is set? Uh, and I would think that uh, different states and different interests would want to make their voice heard at some point were that question to go live uh, in St. Louis, if it ever goes live in St. Louis, um, in that litigation sometime over the next year. So those are my thoughts. Uh, Rich? Thank you, General Custer. Uh, uh, next, we will have Attorney General Richard Cordray of the state of Ohio. Uh, Richard Cordray was elected Ohio's Attorney General in November of 2008. He previously served as Ohio's uh, Treasurer and uh, as treasurer of, the Frank of Franklin County, as a state representative, and as Ohio's first solicitor general. In these various positions, uh, Attorney General Cordray had been, has been dedicated to the value of community service. In 2003, he received the Presidential Service Award from the Ohio Legal Assistance Foundation, and in 2000, the Human Rights Campaign named him Humanitarian of the Year for his efforts promoting tolerance and understanding in communities. Um, General Cordray earned his master's degree with first class honors from Oxford University and graduated from the University of Chicago Law School where he was an editor of the Law Review. Uh, he lives in uh, Grove City in Ohio and my favorite uh, factoid about General Cordray <laughs> is that his earliest claim to fame was as an undefeated five-time champion on Jeopardy. <laughs> General, General Cordray. That's just a little something to wake you up with. <laughs> um, I want to first of all express my appreciation. I know of, of my uh, colleagues, uh, all, all three of us are relatively new state attorneys general, uh, to your attorney general here, Tom Miller. Uh, he is widely respected, uh, perhaps the most respected attorney general on both sides of the aisle. Uh, in our National Association of Attorneys General, and it is due to his efforts in particular that this uh, forum is going forth here in Iowa, and it's because of the uh, respect and, and esteem in which he's held that you had such strong participation. It didn't start out this way, but it ended up with the United States Attorney General coming today, the head of the Antitrust Division, Christine Varney, who I'm, I know has impressed many of you as she impresses us. Uh, and, of course, uh, your home Secretary of, of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. But, uh, but Tom Miller uh, really commands great respect. And for those of you who are Iowans, or as we say in the Big Ten, Hawkeyes, uh, I, I hope you appreciate uh, what, what he does for the people of the state. Um, I also want to say that uh, one of the things that uh, we bring to the table as state uh, antitrust enforcers and state attorneys general is that we bring an intimate knowledge uh, of our states uh, to, uh, to bear. And that's both of our constituencies in the states, of the geographies of our states, of the economies of our states. And I think that that's the way in which uh, we fill a role in joint federal state antitrust enforcement. We have a, a tremendous amount of experience. We have networks, we have relationships of the kind that federal officials could never possibly have in, in the 50 states of the union. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about my home state uh, of Ohio and our agricultural sector, which, uh, as, as Steve said, is, is uh, said in Montana, we, we have been saying for years in Ohio that agriculture is our number one industry. And that's despite the fact that Ohio is a substantially industrial state. We have tremendous amount of auto production. 
uh, steel, we've had rubber, we've had glass, uh, and, and the like. Uh, but agriculture is, was, and remains our number one industry. What kind of agriculture do we have? We have a real blend. We're not as specialized as some states are, so we have, uh, you know, an interest in a great number of the, of the issues that have been brought to bear today. Uh, we have a dairy industry in the state. Uh, we have a wine uh, industry. Did you know that there's an Ohio wine industry? I bet you didn't know that. We, we have one up, up toward uh, Lake Erie on the northeastern side. Uh, in uh, uh, livestock, we have cattle. We have uh, substantial pork production. Uh, we have uh, poultry uh, and we have eggs. We also um, have substantial grain production, mostly corn and soybeans. Those are our leading crops, but we have wheat uh, and, and other things as well. Uh, we, have a, we have fish farms in the state, and we border on Lake Erie, and we have a very substantial fishing industry that comes out of Lake Erie in particular. And we have substantial hunting for personal consumption uh, in our state. So we really have a broad array of, of uh, uh, so-called agriculture plus, I guess I would call it, uh, and we're interested in many of these uh, issues. Uh, among the things that have been talked about and touched on today and are touched on in more detail in the comments that uh, Steve Bullock uh, uh, and others, but, but Steve took the lead in putting together that we have submitted uh, this week. Uh, we are very interested in the railroad antitrust immunity issues. We have been pressing Congress to repeal the antitrust immunity uh, for the railroads because of the concentration that Steve mentioned which we think uh, hurts our grain industry because they're so captive to uh, the costs of, uh, of uh, transporting that. Uh, we are concerned about, uh, although, and, and I would echo uh, what Steve and Chris has said, there are certain uh, advancements that happen and there's no uh, reversing them. The vertical integration uh, in our pork production and our poultry production. Uh, we have uh, the fa so-called factory farms or mega farms and different terminology in different places in Ohio, uh, some of them foreign-owned, that are very substantial operations. And we have a 15.8 million chicken uh, facility uh, northwest of, uh, of Columbus. Those pose special problems. Uh, there may be antitrust issues there. Uh, there may not be. I mean, part of the issue is that with vertical integration come great efficiencies. And if we're competing in a worldwide market, maybe we need those efficiencies. But it also can, can foreclose competition, can, can restrict choice, can affect prices. And part of what the state attorneys general can, can do in antitrust enforcement is give a more intimate window, a, a closer and more detailed uh, window into how those things actually are playing out uh, in different local markets uh, around the country, which is valuable information for our federal uh, cohorts uh, to have. But those also pose non-antitrust issues, but very significant issues. We have big environmental issues in our state with some of the mega farms. Uh, and there's been battles over who should be regulating them, whether it's the Ohio EPA or the Ohio Department of Agriculture, and those are ongoing issues uh, in our state. I would also say that right now, I think, and this was mentioned earlier today, uh, and I pricked up my ears because I've seen it in our state too, we have significant financing issues with respect to the agriculture sector. Just as we have significant financing issues right now with respect to pretty much all of our businesses because of the credit crunch and the financial crisis that, that came upon us in 2008, uh, 2009. Uh, we, are, we have have that concern. We have in the state of Ohio, when I was the state treasurer, I operated, there was a low interest uh, loan re interest rate reduction program for agriculture. Uh, but, but for our farmers to be able to continue to access loans and to be able to do it in ways that is not going to bankrupt them and at interest rates that are affordable and having access to the capital and have their collateral not be called and reassessed in ways that are uh, in some, some cases unreasonable and, and, and may well be unfair uh, is a very great concern uh, for our farmers in Ohio uh, right now. Another interesting aspect of agriculture in Ohio, since we are big in corn and soybeans, is the increasing overlap between our agricultural industry and an alter, our alternative energy, uh, embryonic alternative energy in, industry in the state, which is something that uh, we are encouraging, subsidizing, and incentivizing uh, very substantially. And I think that's true of, uh, of many states, certainly a lot of the Midwestern states, 
Uh, and so you have issues there of how does it affect the economics of agriculture to have tremendous subsidization and, and incentives, uh, and not only for us, but also in the stimulus uh, money that's coming down from the federal government now. Uh, it's certainly been a boost for our agriculture sector, but it's also affecting then input prices for livestock and other things. You know, there's just many different intimate connections uh, among markets, and these are all issues for us. Uh, I, would, I would close by just saying that, that there's different models of federalism and how federal and state officials can cooperate. Uh, the, uh, the least attractive model for us is where the states are regarded as, in effect, field offices of the federal government. Uh, there are areas where that, that is uh, maybe uh, illustrative and, and uh, accurate description of the relationship. N not really true in this sector, I would think. There's also um, uh, the argument that states can be laboratories of, of federalism, where we can experiment with different approaches. That's maybe to a limited degree true here, but our, 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 uh, our markets here have become national and international, so that's really less relevant to the point. Uh, to me, the right model here is one of cooperative federalism, where we and the federal government are working together, uh, really pursuing the same ends with the same objectives. We bring some different talents and, uh, and resources to the table, but if we can work arm in arm, and uh, that certainly has been the experience I've had. I've just been Attorney General for 14 months, and it has been a great relationship between the federal uh, enforcers at DOJ, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, here we're with the Department of Agriculture, and the states. I am told by those who've been around longer that it certainly wasn't always that way and wasn't even that way re very recently. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm especially appreciative of the relationship we've forged uh, with this administration because it does help us uh, both do our work effectively and be as of assistance to the federal officials as they try to do their work effectively. And the power to convene groups like this in a setting like this, and I know they're doing it across the country uh, this year. Uh, and working with the state attorneys general to do that uh, is, I think, especially helpful because try as we might, uh, as well as we think we know our states, those of us who are elected attorneys general, we drive the highways and byways, we're in every corner of the state, we're meeting with all kinds of constituencies, there's always more for us to know. I think that's why God gave us campaigns. But in between campaigns, we can have workshops, and so we will continue to do that. And we appreciate being here with our partners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General Cordray. And uh, you mentioned, and uh, your colleagues mentioned, the uh, comments and the comment process. You all filed comments. Uh, I've been in and out of the conference over the last uh, few hours, and I don't know if it's been mentioned, but every comment, all 15,660-some-odd comments that the Department of Justice uh, and the U United States uh, Department of Agriculture have received are now posted uh, on the Department of Justice website and they are accessible over the web. And we intend to continue that, that process and we will have the State Attorney General's uh, comments up there as soon as possible. Now we turn to the uh, federal uh, component of the enforcement landscape and we're very pleased to have uh, fine representatives of uh, the important constituent agencies in, in that uh, enforcement landscape. Uh, we'll, we'll hear from Steve Obi, Stephen Obi, who is the Director of the Division Enfor of Enforcement at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. We'll hear from John Farrell, who is with uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and oversees three very important agencies at USDA. And we'll hear from Bill Stallings, who is uh, kind of, uh, in, in some ways, the, the chief agricultural enforcer in the antitrust division. He's shaking his head, but, uh, I'm, I'm you know, the assistant chief. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just said in some ways. You know. <laughs> Certainly the go-to guy <laughs> for me. So uh, anyway, we'll start with, uh, with Stephen Obi. Stephen Obi is the director of the Division of Enforcement at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, Mr. Obi joined the CFTC in 1998 as a senior trial attorney in the New York office, and he received his law degree, cum laude, in 1991 from uh, uh, SUNY Buffalo School of Law, and his BA, uh, summa cum laude, I didn't do any of those things, from Drew, from <laughs> Drew University, 
Uh, after law school, he clerked for uh, federal court, uh, court of claims, and uh, uh, the Office of Staff Attorneys at the Eighth Circuit. Prior to joining the CFTC, Mr. Obi was a litigator at Freed Frank, and uh, he was also an adjunct professor and taught a course at Brooklyn Law School called Trading Derivatives. Stephen Obi. Thanks a lot, Mark. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I appreciate that uh, so many of you have hung in. Um, the CFTC's mission, we're about 600 people. We're one of the smallest of federal agencies. Um, as you may know, is to protect market users and the public from fraud, manipulation, and abusive practices related to the sale of commodity and financial futures and options. And our other mission is to foster open, competitive, and financially sound futures and options markets. And in support of that mission, we conduct active surveillance of the commodities futures markets, including the markets in which many members of this audience participate. And when we find wrongdoing, the CFTC's Enforcement Division is committed to ensuring that enforcement of the commodities laws is addressed through civil, criminal, and administrative actions by federal and state agencies wherever possible, including the state attorneys general who are up here today. The agricultural futures markets provide two vital functions. First, futures markets act as a venue for price discovery, and futures market prices can and often do act as references for pricing of cash market transactions. Second, futures markets provide a means of price risk management. For those who choose to use futures markets for risk management, contracts can be bought or sold to lock in prices or to reduce volatility. Market transparency and efficiency are therefore vital to ensuring that agricultural futures markets continue to serve these important roles. In an effort to improve market transparency, the CFTC recently started publishing a revised Commitment of Traders report. The Commitment of Traders report is a weekly summary of trader positions in each market and is aggregated by trader type. We've recently disaggregated some of the trader types and expanded that market transparency. The revision of these new numbers goes a long way to better informing the public of the types of entities that are participating in the commodities markets and sort of the position leanings that they hold. We're unique in that regard as a market regulator in publishing one of the, um, one of the most uh, watched upon reports that our agency push, puts out. Our chairman, CFTC Gary Gensler, has also been leading efforts to regulate the over-the-counter derivatives marketplace. Much of the concerns that have been addressed today about transparency are concerns that he has addressed going forward. Um, we've suffered the worst financial crisis in the past 80 years as a nation, and our chairman has been on the forefront of seeing that effective reform of the over-the-counter marketplace um, occurs. And he believes that three areas need to be revised. First, we must explicitly regulate derivatives dealers. They should be required to have sufficient capital and to post collateral on transactions to protect the public from bearing the costs if dealers fail. Dealers should be required to meet robust standards to protect market integrity and lower risk. Second, to promote public transparency, standard over-the-counter derivatives should be traded on exchanges or other trading platforms. The more transparent a marketplace, the more liquid it is, the more competitive it is, and lowers the cost for companies that use derivatives to hedge risks. Transparency brings better pricing and lowers for all parties the derivatives transactions costs. During the financial crisis, Wall Street and the federal government had no price reference for particular assets, assets that we all started to begin began to call toxic. Financial reform will be incomplete if we do not achieve public market transparency. And third, to lower risk further, standard over-the-counter derivatives transactions should be brought to clearinghouses. Clearinghouses act as a middleman between two parties to a transaction, and they guarantee the obligations of both parties. Clearinghouses in the futures markets have been around since the 19th century and have functioned both in clear skies and dur during stormy times, through the Great Depression, through num numerous bank failures, through two world wars, and through the 2008 financial crisis, to lower public uh, risk. Another issue that is of great importance to the CFTC is the convergence of cash prices and futures prices. While this is not an issue in all markets, price convergence is crucial for those market participants who are using our nation's futures markets. Last year, the CFTC convened a convergence committee 
under the direction of Commissioner Michael Dunn, a resident of the great state of Iowa, and the chairman of the Agricultural Advisory Committee of the CFTC. The committee was originally tasked with assessing convergence issues in wheat markets. However, the CFTC is committed to working with members of industry as well as the futures exchanges to improve convergence wherever there are deficiencies. As a final point, I'd like to emphasize the importance of your role in this room in creating transparent and efficient markets. If you see something that doesn't look right, we want you to bring it to our attention so that we can investigate. At the CFTC, we have a hotline set up to handle calls from the public. We have a dedicated email account to receive referrals or concerns. I encourage all of you to use these resources if you feel that you have any information um, about futures concerns, concerns of um, ripoffs in the futures markets or in other markets. Um, there are two ways to reach us. One is to call us at a toll-free number, 1-866-PHONE-CFTC, phone being spelled F-O-N, which is also 1-866-366-2382, or you can email information to us at enforcement at cftc.gov. In closing, I'd like to thank the Department of Justice and USDA for the leadership in this conference. I'd like to thank you, Mark Toby, for moderating this panel and for all your work on this conference, and my staff who have helped me get up to speed on the issues of this conference, including Mark Higgins, who's here today. Um, I continue to look forward to interacting with everybody in the audience and to hearing more the remarks from my fellow uh, colleagues. Thank you, Steve. Before we uh, go on to uh, John Farrell, the, the unflappable John Farrell, who I've had the opportunity to work with a lot recently and will obviously work with a lot more in the, in the future, I, th I think our FFA volunteers may have uh, left the building. So if you, if you do have questions and you want to hand them to that gentleman there, that is Sam Dinning, who uh, is the main sort of paralegal who helped plan this conference. So uh, please pass your questions to Sam if you have, uh, have questions for this panel. So let's move to John Farrell. John Farrell is the Deputy Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Policy at USDA, and he oversees agencies responsible for ensuring animal and plant health, agricultural marketing, and com competitive and fair trade practices. Prior to working at USDA, John served as the majority professional staff on the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. In this capacity, he provided congressional oversight of implementation of the 2002 Farm Bill and contributed to the development of the 2008 Farm Bill. John grew up on a hog, cattle, corn, and soybean farm in Iowa. John Farrell. Well, thank you. And I, I just want to say that I am not an attorney. I'm kind of outnumbered up here. Uh, I've never been on Jeopardy either. Uh, <laughs> but I did grow up on a hog farm. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I look across this room and I, I recognize a lot of people. I can almost, I just go around and just name every, almost everyone here. It's really great to be back home. I, a little bit about myself, I, I grew up during the farm crisis. Um, I remember what it was like to have eight cent hogs, uh, trying to make it through that. And I remember uh, during that time our bank got overextended and the FDIC came in and closed it down. We had our assets all frozen. Imagine trying to sell fat hogs during 100 degree temperatures and you can't sell your hogs. That doesn't work out so hot. <laughs> um, during, you know, during that time, you know, the, as a, our rural areas, they've got people who are moving out of the county. Um, our school was forced to shut down because it got too small. So when Secretary Vilsack today talked about uh, they, that he was concerned about rural America. I, I share those concerns, and I hope that these workshops will help us um, create a good dialogue and, and have a good discussion on looking at you know, what, is, what is working and what is not working. Uh, at USDA, we are an everyday and an every way department because we truly touch the lives of so many people across the country and overseas. We help farmers produce a sufficient nutritious food supply. We preserve the environment through conservation initiatives. And we make sure our meat, poultry, and eggs are wholesome, fresh. And we help those who need food to, can get it. USDA also plays an important role in ensuring that America's livestock and poultry markets are fair and above board, such as through the Packers and Stockyards Act. 
We also carry out other livestock and other price reporting to improve transparency, such as through the Livestock Mandatory Reporting Act. And under the Perishable Agricultural Commodities Act, we prevent unfair and fraudulent practices in the marketing and selling of agricultural commodities. We also ensure producers that want to join together to improve their market opportunities are not discriminated against just because they belong to an association of producers, such as through the Ag Fair Practices Act. And we also oversee the protections provided in the Capra Volstead Act. Today, I'd like to focus my remarks on the Packers and Stockyards Act, as this law was enacted in 1921 to protect producers from unfair and deceptive practices in the marketplace. GYPSA makes sure the Packers and dealers have the financial protections in place to conduct business, ensure producers are paid promptly, and stop practices that will harm producers. Now, as, I, as you have heard today, there has been a fairly consistent consolidation in the livestock industry, and it continues to evolve. However, increased consolidation and vertical integration is not, by themselves, violations of the Packers and Stockyards Act. But it, what it does do is a consolidated market can increase the potential for unfair practices. And such a market can influence the behavior of those who are dealing with producers. Now, USDA can address unfair practices and other violations under the Packers and Stockyards Act in several ways. First, GYPSA can initiate a complaint or act on complaints from producers, Congress, or, or others. GYPSA has a 24-7 toll-free hotline at 1-800-998-3447 for reporting of complaints. And GYPSA will investigate all complaints received to see if there's sufficient evidence of a violation under the Packers and Stockyards Act. Now, if a violation is determined, GYPSA may get the firm to admit that the violation and pay a fine. If not, GYPSA turns the case over to USDA's Office of General Counsel, who can then file an administrative complaint. Ultimately, USDA can force the firm to cease and desist their activity or pay civil or administrative penalties. Now, at any time, USDA can also work in collaboration with the Department of Justice on these actions as well. Now, the President's new budget for fiscal year 2011 makes important investments for rural communities so that they're self-sustaining and can grow. And in particular, the President has included additional funds for GYPSA to hire 16 investigative staff, which will allow GYPSA to conduct 500 more company audits. This increase builds on increases in 2009 and 2010 to strengthen compliance and enforcement activities. These funds will also help GYPSA better integrate legal capacity in their enforcement process, which is long overdue and has been called on by both USDA's Inspector General and the Government Accountability Office. Now, in our efforts to try to get more funds into our enforcement activities with uh, the Department of Justice now willing to provide us their attorneys, I, I now realize maybe I didn't have to work so hard to try to increase our budget. So uh, we appreciate the help of DOJ. Uh, this funding in increase also allowed GYPSA to streamline its enforcement tracking process by deploying an automated system that tracks investigations from initiation to final resolution, which will allow the agency to more quickly monitor progress and more quickly move investigations to completion. All of these actions will result in increased GYPSA's presence in the marketplace. If we do want to get serious about getting producers into the livestock production, they need to know that the market that they're getting into is fair and above board. We will also be undertaking new rulemaking to ensure fair markets. In December, GYPSA published a final rule on poultry contract fairness that would prevent companies from arbitrarily terminating contracts without providing at least 90 days notice. And the final rule also requires that a, a grower be presented a contract at the same time as the building specifications so that they can make sound business decisions. For too long, we have had complaints from producers where they were saying that they were being told or promised of a very long-term contract. They would go out and get financing. They would start the building of their facility and later find out that when the contract would be presented, it would be in a form that was not very helpful to the producer. And so we wanted to fix the level of the playing field so that when the producer gets their contract, they also are seeing it at the same time of the building specification. So they're not left in a take it or leave it situation. GYPSA is also developing a proposed rule to carry out the livestock title of the 2008 Farm Bill. In general, the Farm Bill required that USDA define undue preferences under the Act and develop criteria it will consider in determining if additional capital investments required of a producer is a violation under the Act. 
It also requires that a reasonable period of time be allowed for producers to remedy a breach of contract. Additionally, it requires that producers be provided a meaningful and fair arbitration process should that producer choose to use arbitration to settle their dispute. Now we encourage those that when these, this rule comes out that you all comment on it. Uh, as you know, the livestock industry is very complex. It's very dynamic. And this rule will need as many uh, as input as we can get from, from everyone in this room and across this country. Lastly, I would just like to comment on the great relationship that USDA has, has got and has had with uh, the Department of Justice in the last year. It has been, you know, in my previous capacity and, and on Capitol Hill, one of my biggest complaints was that uh, I didn't feel that USDA and the Department of Justice did work together. In fact, I don't think they did. But I can say that today that has changed completely. And it's, it's been very good to be able to have such a good working relationship. And so I will, I will stop now. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, lastly, but not least, we have uh, Bill Stallings. William Stallings uh, is the Assistant Chief of the Transportation, Energy, and Agriculture Section, TEA, uh, of the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division. TEA has responsibility within the Department of Justice for the enforcement of the antitrust laws and the promotion of competition for matters involving agricultural commodities such as livestock, grain, and seeds. Mr. Stalling is a graduate of the University of North Carolina School of Law, and I'll have to say he's been a very good sport this year with the Tar Heels having a down year in basketball. Uh, and he joined the division in 1998 and became the assistant chief of TEA in 2005. Bill Stallings. Thank you, Mark. Um, I recognize I'm the, the last panelist after a very long day and that we want to get to the, um, the open mic portion, so I'm going to keep my comments very short. and. Uh, I just wanted to cover a couple kind of quick, almost um, process things, but I think, think um, items which are, are very important, and that is, you know, what exactly does the antitrust division do, and and what is what are the the, the types of interests that, that uh, and uh, issues we examine? Um, we we enforce the antitrust laws, and it, it it's, it's in our name. Uh, the antitrust laws, as most people here know, cover agreements and restraint of trade, monopolization, and uh, merger review. There's a lot of conduct which affects people that, that do not fall into any of those buckets. And that, that's one frustration I think people sometimes have in thinking that something is an antitrust action and although we understand the problem, we understand the issue, it doesn't quite fall into an antitrust framework. Uh, that's, that's one reason we're having these workshops is to work with the other government agencies so that we can figure out and look at the conduct and, and talk to our, 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 uh, our other agencies and, and, and try to get some type of appropriate resolution. But in just looking at the antitrust laws, uh, something that Attorney General Bullock said is, I, I think I want to reframe my comments and, and tee off what he said. JBS did not simply have a change of heart. Uh, the, when we looked at that transaction, I spent you know, a good year and a half of my life on it. Uh, it showed the, what the antitrust division can do, and it showed the, the steps we have to take to get something done. We're not a regulatory agency. We simply can't decide that uh, an industry is too concentrated and say it needs to change. All we can do is, is go to court and ask a judge for relief. Uh, and that is, um, uh, as Attorney General Miller mentioned before, that is a, that, that, that's a big restriction on what we can do, but it's, it's a challenge to us, but it's a challenge that we undertake when, when the facts are right. Um, and in the JBS case, which we can talk about the substance of a lot more in the Colorado workshop this fall, uh, the, the issue is simply, as, as was outlined before, two of the top four uh, uh, beef processors were seeking to merge. Uh, we looked at it. We, we had an incredibly intense factual review. Uh, it started off working very closely with our colleagues at USDA to get, as soon as the deal was announced, to get a kind of a, uh, an understanding of, of their view of the market, since obviously they, they live with them day in and day out. Uh, we worked very closely with the, the state AGs. The, all the states represented here were on a, a working group we had to, to investigate the case. Uh, they, um, the, the working group conducted uh, numerous, numerous interviews of, of market participants. And I personally know we've interviewed many people in this room as a, in, in connection with that case. Uh, and all that was an effort to us to, to develop the facts 
that once we decided the facts justified a challenge to the case, we could present to the court. And uh, we had to, we did that. We had to do it on, on a, a, by legal time frames, a very quick time frame. Uh, and we, we challenged the case in uh, federal district court in Chicago. Uh, and about four months into the litigation, the, the parties abandoned the deal. Uh, it, it was a very significant case for us, uh, but both in showing that um, that we take any that we take agricultural issues very seriously, but I think it was also significant on a substantive level, and that one of the critiques that, that we've heard very frequently is that the antitrust division does not care about farmers, does not care about producers. If you look at that at that the complaint we filed, uh, it has uh, one of the, 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 in describing the anti-competitive effects, it first looked at the, the effects a transaction would have on consumers. Obviously, that's the bread and butter of what the antitrust division is all about, ensuring lower prices, ensuring innovation, ensuring that, that, com that consumers get the benefits of competition. But if you, if you look at the complaint, there is another section of it. Now, that section was about the harm that that transaction would cause to producers. And we outlined the, the harm as we saw it in, in, in regional geographic markets for the uh, ranchers. And we, we challenged the case on that ground. And it, it, I think it should show convincingly to everyone in the audience here that the antitrust division will take action to, to preserve competitive markets for, for producers. Um, in, I, I, I want to just kind of stress one more thing about, about that case and about our investigations in general, is that we do need cooperation of, of, of people, basically people in this room and others, that when we conduct our investigations, we need to call, we need to gather facts. And it's, I, you know, we, we want, obviously we want to hear general concerns about competition in the industry, but we also don't want to hear specific facts that will help us to develop, develop cases when we're, when we're doing our, our merger review. And that, uh, you know, if, if some deal gets announced down the road, don't be surprised if basically we cold call you one day to say we understand that, that you're in the industry. We are, as Attorney General Holder said this morning and, and as uh, President Eisenhower quote, you know, me and my colleagues, we are the ones with the pencils in Washington trying to figure out, you know, what, what's going on. And we do need your assistance to, to develop facts. Uh, at the end of the day, when we look at the factual record, we might find that the, the, the merger is, is not anti-competitive, and we may close our transaction, uh, close our review of it. The merger may go forward, and there may be a sense of frustration. But we need to make a call on the merits. And when we do find facts that support a, um, a reason to challenge a merger, we will do so. And as uh, Assistant Attorney General Varney said today. Uh, you know, we just two weeks ago sued to, to unwind a, a Dean Foods uh, a milk merger. So, uh, and I think I, I have to qualify this a little bit, but of the litigated challenges to mergers in the, in the past few years, uh, JBS and Dean Foods, both agricultural ones, both the, the uh, I think there was one other one that was, that was litigated, but you can tell that the focus is on agriculture, and we are, uh, we are serious about that focus. Um, and, and it, there is, there is a, a frustration on our end at times in that we, we do recognize we have to go to court and that the burden of proof that we bear is, is it's, a, it's, a, it's a strenuous one. It, we, we, do, we have to convince the judge that a merger should be stopped. That sometimes frustrates us in our, our goal of uh, in basically advocating for a competitive market. So in addition to our enforcement activities, we do take very seriously our role as a government agency that can engage in competition advocacy. And I think as you can see from this workshop, we want to work with the other agencies, with the states, to when, it, when we don't quite have enforcement actions that might raise, that, that might uh, address competitive issues, we can use a competition advocacy angle to try to, to, to make markets more, more effective. Uh, Thank you, Bill. All right, it's been a long day. Uh, we were going to have a little dialogue about a question. We want to get to the uh, farmer testimony phase. There were several good uh, questions or comments that came forward. I want to get to two of them and, and then maybe just ask if any of the participants on the panels have any, any closing thoughts they want to give. Uh, Steve, I'm afraid you, you drew one of these questions I want to ask you. That's why we're here. Don't All be right. afraid. Uh, 
The question is, what would it take to extend CFTC authority to cover cash daily uh, trading at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange? In some ways, it would take um, an act of Congress to extend our authority in any, in any um, area. But um, this is one of the areas where the Division of Enforcement is looking at in terms of um, cases. If you take a look at the DFA case that we brought um, a couple years ago, that involved, in some respects, not only milk futures, but the cheese market. And our statute is fairly broad so that if um, there are cash market issues that affect the futures markets, um, we can be involved. And I, and I can say that we have partnered um, in a number of uh, cases with USDA and others. So if there's a, a specific allegation, I would definitely like to, to know about it so I could follow up on it. Thank you. Uh, the other question I'd like to handle myself, uh, the question is, given the power that retailers like Walmart have in the food supply chain, will the Federal Trade Commission be involved in future hearings? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, the hearing that, uh, the workshop that we're planning uh, on December the 8th in Washington, D.C., uh, we will ask the Federal Trade Commission, and I think they will uh, be involved in that hearing, uh, where we will talk about uh, where the food dollar goes from the farm gate to, uh, to the retail sale, and the FTC will be a part of that. Uh, so uh, let me just then turn it back to the panel and say, does anybody have any parting thoughts or comments? Steve? Okay, so... Um, I, you know, I've, I'm taking away three things um, from this workshop, and I really appreciate the dialogue um, that's occurred. One, um, to USDA and to the DOJ, the CFTC would like to participate in the uh, task force. Um, we've already detailed to the criminal division of DOJ a couple of CFTC attorneys, um, and we certainly want to be a, a member of this task force with regard to um, uh, the USDA. Second, clearly pricing issues are of great concern to everyone. Dominance and transparency are the issues, and I think in the following workshops that we have that um, that should be something that um, gets addressed. And then finally, continuing the dialogue with all aspects of not only the industry, the regulators, um, the state's attorneys general is very important as we go forward. And, and I appreciate the opportunity that I've had to uh, get together here and to meet with so many people because that dialogue is very important. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right. Let me just say, we'll, we'll move to the uh, farmer testimony uh, Im immediately, I think, or as quickly as we can. Uh, just because we're enforcers, I want to I say also that uh, I know I am willing, uh, the Department of Justice is, is willing, and the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture is willing uh, although we've been trying to develop a very public record here, we are willing to meet with people confidentially if that is something that you would require. And uh, if, if you uh, would like that kind of treatment, please uh, give me a card, give me something, let me know, and we'll follow up with you. Thank you.